Yeah, whenever you want to hit the record button, we'll be ready to go. All right, man, I'm ready. All right. Um, <clears throat> so today's topic for for the webinar here, food plot pyramid or the food plot triangle, however you want to go about it. So obviously at the peak of the triangle, you know, essentially it's like a house, you know, you have your roof, your studs, and your foundation. So, um, like I said, it's no different than a house or a pyramid when it comes to the whole ideology of food plots and, you know, having a raw piece of land. So at the foundation of the pyramid, you for food plots, you have your greens. So what do I mean by greens? Everybody thinks, well, we got a... We got a raw piece of land. We got an opening. That's a half an acre. We got to plant corn. We got to plant soybeans. We got to we got to plant these major crops for these whitetails, and you know, compete with all these people that are uh, on the TV shows and stuff out in the Midwest that we got to put all this corn, all these beans in to attract whitetail deer. And really, when you have limited acreage, that's not always the best thing. So let's start at the foundation. So. We're going to kind of work backwards a little bit. So this is going to be, there's only three different topics about this whole thing because the triangle is broken up into three different topics or three different food plot plantings, I should say. So right at the very be, at the very bottom of the foundation, we want our food plot greens. So that's our clovers, perennial and annual. We have our, like, I'm going to throw chicory into that mix. I'm going to throw the, all the different cereal grains. So that's going to be your wheat and your rye and your oats, your barley, triticale, all that different stuff. And then obviously the biggest one is your brassicas. So your turnips and your radishes and your sugar beets and your, your kale and, and rape and all those different types of brassicas. Uh -huh. And of course there's way more out there than what I just said, but, but all those different plants there are going to help build your deer herd. It doesn't matter if you have five deer per square mile or if you have a hundred deer per square mile. You want to start at the base. You want to you want to slowly work up to your bigger crops that are corn and soybeans. And I'm not against planting those bigger crops. You just have to have either the acreage or you got to know how to protect that crop in a small area. And I'll talk about that a little bit, you know, as we go along here. But the foundation of all food plot plantings is those greens because they're the driving force. It's they're palatable. They're easy to plant. So and a lot of them don't require a whole lot of nutrients. I mean, your brassicas are going to require a little bit more than what your clovers are. Your clovers are going to tolerate poor soils and whatnot. And then there's obviously different herbicides that you can spray on your clovers. I mean, and, and your brassicas too, that you can use to spray down to, uh, take out some of the weeds. But for the most part, as a foundation of all your food plot plantings, I would definitely go with your clovers and your brassicas. You can always add your cereal grains into both of those. When September comes around here in the Northeast you get further south, you're going to go October, even into November, like Florida, Alabama, Georgia, stuff like that. And obviously, in and out in the Midwest, you know, September, you know, August, September is a good time, just like the Northeast as well. But, but the, like I said, those cereal grains are easy to maintain and your, and your clovers and your brassicas, and you can plant them in your smaller areas. So if you have an eighth of an acre here, a quarter acre here, three quarters of an acre, or maybe you have, maybe you're very fortunate and you have an acre or more in standing timber that's completely low wide open. I know I'm very fortunate with our property up on the mountain. It's big woods. Our biggest food plot is an acre and a third in size. So that's our biggest one that's cleared enough that I can plant a lot of tonnage like that. And that's what's going to drive your your does to have more fawns because they're going to have more forage and stuff. Your bucks are going to get carried through the winter more because of having all the, all the different bulbs from your brassicas and whatnot. And then your cereal grains and your clovers staying green through the fall with that mix. And then after a lot of that other stuff dies out 
in you know in the spring it's going to bolt right back up with cooler temperatures yet before any canopy closure comes in or any natural browse comes up your clovers and your cereal, cereal grains are going to come back so that's kind of our stepping block for holding and drawing deer into the property i mean this is going to also help turkeys it's going to help other wildlife in general and you know we're helping deer but we're also helping the soil yet too we're building soil up we're planting different species multiple species in the same area so they're pulling different nutrients up providing that to the wildlife and dying and rotting and creating organic matter and putting that right back down into the soil so um if you're going to do anything start with those plants first <clears throat> so like i said though um with that being the foundation, that can be in big woods in the Northeast. It can be out in the Midwest where you have a lot of open fields. You want to start out with that maybe because your deer populations are a little smaller. So that's going to slowly start building your deer population up to carrying capacity at that point. So it really doesn't matter if it's an eighth of an acre in the woods or if you have three acres of open pillable land out in the midwest or in the south or wherever it's at so that's the foundation of of the food plot pyramid so so now we're going to go to um the second step and that's that's the middle of the triangle now we're going to get into a little more of the the site specific plantings now so it's it's this one's going to be a little bit harder now so Everybody wants to plant corn and soybeans yet, too, as they master the foundations. Okay, we got our good food plot program started now, so now we're building a deer herb. We're understanding you know, their the, the nutrient requirements, sounds stuff. So now let's give them a little bit something more to drive them through the wintertime. Um, you know, this is going to be driven home for, you know, like New York, Ohio, Illinois, Indiana, Pennsylvania, you know, the, the northern states, you know, you or even the Midwestern states where we get a lot of cold temperatures, snow, and this can go all the way up into Canada too as well. So um, corn, corn is the middle of the triangle. So, so if you guys are going to plant corn, you're going to, I mean, you can broadcast corn, you can disc ground, you can broadcast the seed, you can drag it in and all that stuff. But honestly, to get the best food plot crop out of corn, you're going to either want to get a no-till drill, a small corn planter, if it's pulling it behind an ATV or a small tractor, or a buddy of yours, you know, has farming equipment that you can pay them to go plant your corn for you or whatever, then that, really that's honestly how you're going to get the best results because it's going to plant it uh, at a specific rate and it's going to get in the ground really, really well. It can reach the soil moisture that way, blah, blah, blah. So, but then if you're going to go plant corn, you need, I would recommend Roundup Ready Corn because then you can go in and spray it. You can get your Monsanto license number and it's real easy to do. You just call in. I have mine. You don't need to pay for it or anything. You just go online. They tell you to sign a couple applications and stuff, and then you get your number. And then you can go online. When they say you need your number, you can put it right into the system and go buy a Roundup Ready Crops. Yes. Is it going to be expensive? Sure. But um, it reassures you for weed control then. So anyways, corn, like I said, is a really good, like, November, December, January time frame planting. So now that we have the foundation of greens, let's say we open up more food plots in the woods or now let's rotate our brassicas and stuff and do half a field where it's two acres of corn, two acres of brassicas now. So now you got the best of both worlds. So deer need those carbohydrates from the corn. So there might be the warmer days where the deer are hitting the greens, which that, that does hold true. If you do a lot of your research, watch a lot of videos, I, I do tend, even for us on our mountain ground, I've seen deer go 
from walking through the soybeans going and corn and then walking right to the greens because I don't know what it is with it being warmer out and stuff. Those deer tend to be drawn to those more leafier, greenier plants, you know, that have a lot of moisture in them. So, but then once you start getting to like, let's say ahead of a cold front or whatever, it, it drops 20, 30 degrees out and, you know, you're at, you know, you're in the twenties, you know, you're in single digits and it's snowing. Well, those deer need something to keep their body temperatures and their core temperatures up. So they go and eat corn and corn is carbohydrates. It's no different than humans eating pasta because pasta is derived from grain, ground up grain. It gives you initial um, energy and it allows you to, it allows your body to warm up quicker. It's no different than somebody eating pasta before a soccer game, a football game, wrestling match, you know, baseball game, whatever. It's there to give you initial energy and get you going right away. So that's why you tend to see a lot of deer in cornfields in the wintertime because they're helping build up their carbohydrates in their system and staying warm. So it's awesome winter food and it's also good cover. Um, you know, I'm going to reference for out in the Midwest, you know, a lot of those places have small islands of woods and they have hundreds of acres of open fields. So a lot of times that corn is cover and it's edge for those deer to follow from one block of woods to another block of woods that are 10 or 15, maybe 20 acres each as they go out through. So it's not necessarily all the time feeding deer, but it's helping them travel and it's helping them feel safe too. So um, so with corn, you need a lot of space for the most part. You need a lot of space to grow corn. You need multiple acres to grow corn, um, and a lot of sunlight. So, um, to get the best corn crop possible, and it is definitely a nitrogen hog. So you're going to need to put down a lot of urea fertilizer, which is 4600, depending upon your soil test and whatnot. Um, or, you know, if you can get some, you know, local chicken manure or cow manure, or horse manure, or whatever, and putting it on your food plots too, I mean, that's another good way of getting it. And it's organic compared to synthetic fertilizer that a lot of people do use on food plots. And like I said, I still do too, but um, I did cover um, the carbohydrates and stuff. Um, also, you can grow corn in smaller food plots. Um but you do not want to leave them planted and walk and walk away from it. Um, like I said, I've tinkered around with corn in the mountain already, and I plant it on eighth of an acre and quarter acre sections already. But you have to have, like I said, you have to have Roundup Ready corn because if you're discing soil or in, in, you know you're no tilling and you got a a terrible weed issue, whatever it may be, some real pesky weeds, you need ground up ready corn. Not unless you want to go through there and you want to cultivate rows every three weeks between the rows. So it just makes it easier if you live farther away, you know, you can go and spray down your corn being so that it is roundup resistant and, and keep your weeds in check. But if you are planting smaller acreage corn, you need to put up a dual perimeter electric fence. You have to. Um, I don't, I just, I don't know what it is. Sometimes deer will eat corn and, and, and pick it out of the ground. And then sometimes they'll leave it alone. Maybe in your area, you know, you see in the fields that deer are leaving it alone. So maybe you can get away with planting it in a half acre, three quarters of an acre, an acre section, the deer leave it alone. I don't know. I just know from my experience that no sooner I get that seed in the ground, I get that fence up the same day or I get it up the day after, because I don't want those deer associating that area with the food that I planted for them at that time. I want them to be associated with it later on in the fall and winter when I take the electric fence down then. At that point, that's when I want the deer in there feeding. I don't want them going through there and plucking out little corn plants all the way through, or the corn comes up really good. Let's say I take the chance. Let's say I I plant it, corn grows up, you know, six, seven, eight feet tall, maybe 10 feet tall, all of a sudden it's tasseling out, looks good. And all of a sudden, the silk starts popping out on the ends of the cobs, and the deer go through and rip all the silk off. Well, that's helping the tassels on the top fertilize the corn cob that's growing. 
So it doesn't have any carrier of pulling in that pollen now at that point. So that, those deer killed all that corn. So, you know, you're going to spend a couple hundred dollars in seed and fertilizer, maybe thousands of dollars to plant corn. Corn is not a cheap plant food plot crop to put in the ground. It's just not. If you want the best food plot crop corn wise, you need to do it right. So my suggestion is if you're doing anything smaller than I'm going to say three to five acres of corn, you need to put an electric fence around it, especially with high deer densities. So now that we talked about the foundation, growing a deer herd, it's looking good. Now we want to tinker around with corn. So now the deer have best of both worlds. They have a lot of greens of high protein and a lot of nutrient content in them with the moisture and stuff from our brassicas and our cereal grains and our clovers that are full of protein. Now they have corn in the center now of the pyramid where they get their carbohydrates. It pushes that deer herd through the winter a little bit more. And the, like, like I said, this isn't all about deer too. This is going to help turkeys too through the winter time as well. And back to the electric fence, you can keep out, you know, bear that way then possibly raccoons too based upon where the level of the fence is set at, even groundhogs. But you're always going to have a couple pesky, you know, squirrel and coon and uh, smaller birds and crows and stuff like that go through and pick out the stuff anyway, especially in big woods country where I'm at. I always refer to it there because, like I said, plant food plots in the middle of mountain country, it's, it's tough because no matter if you have a lower deer density or higher deer density, they're there no matter what, especially if you have green in the middle of the woods and you're not protecting it with a dual perimeter electric fence. So we talked about those two now. So let's jump to the top of the pyramid, which is, it's going to be the bean family. So soybeans. So this really, you know, the, the corn and soybeans part of the pyramid is, going to be a real small percentage of landowners that can actually do it it's it's i mean i'm i'm gonna say maybe in in this community which i'm not offending anybody you might be looking at five to ten percent of the people but due to you know having the land to do it the equipment to do it and the time to do it and the money um but you know you you work with a local farmer you know you might get real fortunate might you might allow you to use his equipment he might have leftover seed from the year before or whatever round up ready corn and beans and he's gracious enough to give it to you you know i've had that happen already before so um so that you can definitely go that route but soybeans are at the top of the pyramid and soybeans i think they're they're probably the best food pot crop you can plant for whitetail deer Pro most of the time you're going to get nine to 10 months of use of so out of soybeans for whitetail deer. The only point I've seen is like the September, October time frame where deer, as the soybeans are dying and drying down, the deer seem to leave them alone in that time frame. And there's a lot of biologists out there and a lot of other landowners I've worked with out there that are seeing the same thing. I mean, not unless your habitat is not up to par, that would be the only reason why those deer are going to be eating those beans throughout that dry down period is that, that they're that starving for food. But anyways, that's besides the point. But, um, yeah, soybeans are definitely the number one. Um, and I'm going to kind of categorize this. So you got, you got soybeans. I'm going to put like sunflowers as kind of like a top tier one here yet too. Um, that deer really like to pound real hard too if you don't take care of it too as well lab lab is another one cow peas other vining soybeans uh, you know now guys are turn tinkering with green beans now too in their food plots you know a lot of that stuff that's really palatable and really high in protein and that type of stuff that grows really quick like that the deer tend to like and once they snip it off at a small stage it's dead it's it's not coming back so if deer say that soybean pops out of the ground and it all 
of a sudden, you know, as, as the soybean comes up, the seed splits and it forms a root underneath. And that seed, when it splits at the top, in the center is where it's producing its new leaves to become the actual soybean plant. So that's called the cotyledon stage at that point. So if there's deer going through and the beans have popped up and that deer bites down on the cotyledon and leaves just the actual stem then, that soybean's dead. But if that soybean gets up and forms its first set of leaves and all of a sudden the deer only bites off one of the leaves on the side, that soybean still has a chance of actually continuing to grow and branch out like a tree at that point because now that it's injured, it's going to send other stems out from that bite that the deer actually did or took from the soybean. So and that's going to be the same with sunflowers too. I experimented with sunflowers. If you have a high deer density too, uh, sunflowers are a waste of time too if it's in a small plot. Corn and soybeans – are plants that you cannot plant in a small plot without an electric fence. You, you, you just can't because you don't want to jeopardize the money that you put into it and have it all go to waste. So, like I said, with soybeans, you have 10 months of use. After that, let's say that bean grows up, it's looking good. Yeah, and I'm going to recommend Roundup Ready Soybeans too because then you take care of the weed problems yet too. You fertilize it real good with potash fertilizer because soybeans don't need nitrogen you could get like an o2020 fertilizer or something basic to put down that to get phosphorus and potassium but a lot of times those beans need a lot of phosphorus and that's going to produce a lot of uh antler development bone development you know better nutrient content in the milk of the mother of the does that are feeding the fawns. Soybeans are really high in that and all the different minerals that are very high in protein yet too on top of it. So let's say you're fortunate enough and you own a 500 acre farm out in the Midwest and you have 50 acres of tillable. You're darn right. I'd be putting corn and soybeans in because you have that, you have that acreage and you have the resources and the time and the money and the energy, I would be putting that stuff in. Not to say that I wouldn't be doing, you know, I wouldn't be doing all 50 acres in corn and soybeans. I still would be using my foundational principal plants like clovers and your brassicas and your cereal grains. You want all three of these plantings. Even though it's just listed as greens, greens has a whole bunch of different plants under it. Corn, obviously, is just one you can get different varieties and different strains of corn that are some of them are geared towards towards wildlife more. Some are geared towards you know, the farmer more. So you might want to experiment with that. And then there's some soybeans. There's different maturing rates. There's uh, a zero maturing rate all the way up to, I believe, I think it goes all the way up to like an eight, maybe a nine mature rate. For soybeans so the bigger the number on the bag so let's just say it's a that's a seven maturing rate it's going to take it longer and longer and longer to grow and form pods at that point so when you have ones like that so a lot of the industry wants you to plant forage soybeans for white-tailed deer we got to give we got to really pump the leaves out and give them the best tonnage that way for them to eat Okay, well, that's only going to help you for only a couple, like only like five months out of the year at that point. You know, if you plant them, you plant a forage bean that matures later in the year, yeah, maybe it's good for archery season and stuff like that with having still green leaves on it. But a lot of the times, though, depending where you're planting it, if you plant too late, you don't have any pods. So. Let's say you got an acre food pot, you planted these forage soybeans, all it did was feed the deer leaves all summer and early fall long, but then because you planted them too late, never they never formed pods. So now you cl you clean the table. There's nothing there for a white-tailed deer to eat. I'm going to recommend that you plant a bean to, an to anybody that's you know listening here or later on. You want to plant a bean that produces pods. And 
you want them to produce heavy and you want the plants to die off early. So I'm saying like the beginning of September, I want to start seeing yellowing leaves drying down. I want to see the leaves hitting the ground. I want to see sunlight hitting underneath where the soybeans are at. So then you can broadcast your foundational principal plants into your soybeans. And you can do the same thing with corn. As long as you keep the corn and the soybeans maintained, sprayed and get the weeds out of them, as they die down in late August, early September, depending when you planted them, if you planted them early enough, they're going to die sooner in the late summer, early fall. You can broadcast your cereal grains. You can broadcast your annual clovers. You can even broadcast some of the brassica plants, like let's say radishes is one of them, because radishes can grow really quick. They can grow with like between 40, I think it's between 40 and 50 days they can mature that quick. So you can plant that stuff in September. And you can plant that down the rows of the beans and the corn. So now you have your foundational greens and you have your grains yet too on top of it. So, you know, as we, as we kind of go along here with soybeans, obviously, you know, the soybeans through the summertime after planting are going to be very good for the mothers producing milk for the fawns. going to be good for antler growth. Don't forget about trail camera pitchers, you know, uh, it's pretty awesome when you get to stare out in a 20, 30 acre bean field near to your house somewhere near a property, or maybe it's on your property and see all those big velvet bucks coming out and beating on soybeans all summer long. So getting inventory of your whitetails is also really good with having the tier planting of the food plot pyramid. Obviously it's going to produce really good winter forage too, as well, because beans, unlike corn beans are, the pods themselves are still high in protein, the bean is, and they're high in fats and oils. So corn, on the other hand, they've done some tests. It does. There's certain corns that have different levels of protein. It's not very high. It's mostly just carbs. It's like, I'm going to grab it, I'm going to eat it, I'm going to go, I'm going to go into the next thing. So maybe deer eat, eat in the corn for a little bit, and then they go to the soybeans. And obviously, too, you're going to see deer hitting the soybeans, too, when it gets really, really cold out, too, as well. Um, and the deer are going to eat that whole pod right off the plant. They don't split it open and eat the beans or anything. They're going to eat that whole pod. So that's going to supply them fats and oils. So the combination of carbs from the corn and then to get their fats and oils from the soybeans yet, too, that's what's building up their fat reserves to survive the wintertime. And obviously, too, if it warms up or whatever, you know, they're going to eat the greens. I mean, deer are still going to eat the bulbs and dig down through the snow and eat, you know, your brassica plants like your turnips and your radishes and other stuff, too. So, But now you can kind of see, though, guys, that once you start with the foundation of your greens, you work to the corn, you, you work to the difficult plant scent at that point. But that's going to be some of the most tier properties or the people that have experimented with it long enough that they know what they're doing. They know how to protect those crops. They know how to manage them and maintain them in big woods country or out in the Midwest, wherever it may be. If you have open fields on your property, you know, it's definitely a good place to do corn and soybeans because they're getting a lot more sun. I mean, it's going to be good for any type of planting, but especially for corn and soybeans. So, and like I said, soybeans need space to grow. They need a lot of sunlight. Soybeans don't tend to need as much nutrients as what corn's going to, but like I said, per soil test is going to tell you what you need to do to grow soybeans. And another thing that people forget to do a lot of times, they get soybeans, they throw them in the ground. It's the first time. It's a brand new food plot. We're going to plant this. Don't forget inoculant. And what do I mean by inoculant? It's a little bag that you can get from any... Like you type in soybean inoculant, it'll come up. You can get it from some of these local farming outlets online and whatnot and stuff like that. But it's sphagnum moss. It's going to help. It's a living organism. It's going to go and adhere to the seed as you're putting it through a broadcast spreader or you're going to put it through a no-till drill or you're putting it in a corn planter with the bean plates in the corn planter or wherever it may be. It's going to adhere to the bean seed itself. And as that plant grows, it's going to bind to it, and it's going to create nodules on the root system of that plant. And that's called nitrogen fixation. So if you weren't, 
if you want to have done that to a brand new area planting soybeans, that plant then can't fix nitrogen for itself to feed off of because of not having that bacteria in the soil. So anytime you're planting soybeans, I don't care if it's in a plot that you've been planting soybeans every other year between, you know, corn and bean rotation or brassicas or whatever it may be, even though that bacteria is probably in the soil after that long a time, it's just a reassurance policy that it's going to help your soybeans thrive a little bit better than not having um, the inoculant. So, and like I said, maintain them with an electric fence to save them. Then you can manage that and lay down the fence then at a certain time during the gun season or the late season, you know, up on our property. I know as the year goes on, more and more deer come into our property on the mountain because we have the limiting resource with all the different food plots and all the habitat management that's around. So they're congregating there. They're coming from the neighbors, you know, all that stuff. So I want my corn and beans and brassicas to shine during that four weeks of late season right here in central Pennsylvania because I know all those deer are coming and finding those resources. So I'm going to take down the electric fence from my corn and soybeans about a week before the season starts so that they get conditioned to come in. That's when you set your trail cameras up and you fine tune your food plot program with the use of the food plot pyramid. So that's all I got. It's kind of short and sweet. So um, if there's any questions, fire away. I'm new to doing food plots. So when's actually the best time to start food plots? I've never done one. My entire time of hunting. Where are you from? Uh, Missouri. Missouri. Oh, you're in a good state for for hunting all in general. So, um, yeah, uh, you know, right now, you know, we're in the middle of May. I don't know what your temperatures are like out there if you're getting rains right now. But, no, we're getting um, a lot of rain. You're getting a lot of rain. Okay, well, um, it's never, you know, the best time to, you know, just like a tree. It's kind of like the same principle, you know, but you get that food plot in, you know, it'll, it'll last you a long time, depending on what you're planning, if it's a perennial or, or whatever. So, you know, you'll regret like right now is a good time to be doing a lot of your spring planting. So that's going to be like your corn and your soybeans, grain, sorghum, sunflowers, your different perennial clovers and stuff like that. Chicory, um, whole host of stuff that you can do that way. So, but if you kind of skip over this time frame, you're still in the ball game. You have, you know, the to the end of July, well, the at the end of July, all through August, and even into September to plant your fall food plots. So you're you're plenty good. Okay. Cool. Thank you. It just depends on what you want to plant and what the that. acreage is like, or if you have openings on your land, or you get some in there with a contractor with a dozer or whatever to open plots up, you know, or if you have your own equipment, it, you know, wildlife management and how you want to do it is it's, it's all, it's always a puzzle that you can put together your own way. Okay. You can do it. You can fine tune it however you want. There's no set rules or standards. There really is. And you can experiment. I'm just giving you information that of what I've experienced over, you know, my years of doing this and working with my clients through my wildlife and forestry consulting business. So, um, you know, you can, you can take this and, and go do it, or you can do the total opposite and see what happens. I don't know. I don't know how you, what your deer density is like there or whatnot, but I, I would go all out and protect your resource as much as possible. If you're doing small food plots with corn and beans, I would highly advise putting an electric, dual perimeter electric fence up there's lots of youtube videos out there on it and a lot of times you can go and get a lot of your supplies from your local co-op and you can slap it all together for i just bought all the stuff for a guy i'm going to put up for one of my clients it was it was just a little over 500 bucks to throw everything together but you might be able to find stuff cheaper okay all right thank you yeah you're welcome anytime that's not too bad, five hundred bucks, and it probably pays for itself. I mean, with how much you oh my save gosh, yes. and having to replant, and and you know, honestly, absolutely, a waste of time. So, I could see that. Well, that I can working. tell you, 
if you look up some of the kits online, some of them don't stop at two thousand dollars. Dang. To put up a dual perimeter electric fence when you can go to your local co op and do your research and maybe you do it for three or four hundred dollars and do it real cheap and have the same exact stuff. It's just because they're slapping a big logo on it in the name. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's all it is. And nor the then most nine chances out of ten they're the chintziest, most garbage setups you'll get. I was get. gonna say you could probably take a like an old trail camera <laughs> days of the car battery and the I'm serious. <laughs> Yep. But uh nice man, that's that's great. Um do do any of y'all other guys have any questions? I would say though, Scott, just just because it's your first time doing food plots and whatnot, I would start obviously with the first thing I said, the most foundational principle of food plot plants you can possibly do. Because they're easy to do, they're smaller seeds, you don't have to put a whole lot out. The seeding rates are are much lower compared to what the corn and soybeans are going to be. So like your, your clovers, your, your brassicas and stuff like that, you really, you really can't go wrong with them. Okay. So you'll want to do that. Like if you want to do your clover plans, you can do them now. Um, just reach out to me. You want to know the steps of, you know, doing a whole food plot, why not? Please feel to reach out on social media if you have it. Um, you know, and and then your your brassica plots. You know, during the the latter part of the summer, like in all, I usually here in PA, I normally strive to start my brassica plantings at the end of July. But I like the bulbs to get as big and nasty as they possibly get because I want to produce as much tonnage and food in on my property as possible. So I don't want those deer walking off to the neighbors feeding in his food pots because we have neighbors that butt right up to us that they have food pots on their property too. So I want my food pots to be the best quality forage possible. Okay. Well, spot I got, it's a buddy I work with. It's his parents. It's like 40 acres. Mm-hmm. But it's like spotty. It's patchy timber and a lot of open and two or three ponds. But the spot, mm-hmm. some of the spots I'd picked out, they're probably a half acre, but they're like a half moon cut out of the timber. Mm-hmm. It's all open and then i figured them would be pretty good spots i'm heading away from the neighbors absolutely especially with that half moon shape you hunt in that center portion where it kind of narrows down that's a pinch point so they yeah. might not necessarily be feeding in there he might that buck just might be cruising through there in the rut to go look at what at each end of the plot and you're right there in the center then i walked out there two months ago and the two spots I picked out to put food plots, you can see where they're just tearing it up. They're walking back and forth. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a steady trail from the pond to the neighbors, and then they're coming back. That already back. sounds like a already sounds like a transition area. So if you put food in their way, they're going to slow down. Okay. Cool. Absolutely. Now, do I need to like tear all the grass out, like till it up, or how would I? Um, being that being so that it's like a new area and there's brush and it's, you know, a little forested and whatnot, or it's got some grass or blackberry raspberry or, you know, different things popping up. Yeah. You definitely want to go in and clear it up the best you can and break ground, you know, level it up the first time. But after that, depending what you're planting, you can time it with like, for me, let's just say you, let's say that half acre, let's say you go with clover and you plant the whole thing in clover, different varieties of clover, different species. And, you know, later on in like September, what I would do is, is I would go get wheat or winter rye and I would broadcast that right into your clover because then it's going to act as a cover crop for your clover. And it's going to also give those deer, those cereal grains through the winter time, because, you know, I've seen deer dig down into clover because it's the only thing that was in the area that was available. But you want to eat a little clover plant that's the size of my pinky or do you want to eat turnips and radishes that are size of a softball? You know what I mean? So by adding that extra diversity of your cereal grains in with your clover, that gives them something to eat in the winter time. Then when the clover's dormant. Okay. We and it's actually, also real good. You leave that seed out the following year and that's real good for your hens and their, and their pulps then. Cause it acts as real good cover and, also, the fawns will hide in it, too, the following year when the wheat and the rye get three, four foot tall 
grown out of your clover. All right. We just actually, food for thought. We actually just incorporated that into our food plots this year. Was the we went with flawless whitetail, uh, the bold madness, but it's you know the turnips and radishes, and we just we just now put that in last week. So I'm I'm curious to see how it does. Good deal. Little so variety. Uh... Just trying to get some variety. Our plot's the same thing in Virginia. We got 300 and I think it's like 384 acres and it's a travel quarter that goes right up the mountain. And then we have two neighbors that do the same thing. And uh, every all the deer want to come to ours, at least all the does, which obviously brings all the bucks. Um, and uh, it's the same thing. They'll leave the neighbors because they don't have as much variety uh -huh. and you know, obviously my great uncle, he's in his seventies, so he's been doing it a while, but mainly more trial than error than I think education. And, uh, it definitely, that variety definitely helps because as soon as that rut kicks, the bucks don't go nowhere. We watch the same bucks stay in the same circle all day. They don't need to go nowhere. They have no reason to. Justin hit, you hit the nail right on the head. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how many guys I discuss the same thing with. If you have multiple food plots on your property, depending what it is, be, make it a variety. Do some clover plots. Do some brassica plots. Do some uh, summer annual plots of different seeds of, like, soybeans and grain sorghum and some flowers and stuff. Plant some corn over here. Plant some soybeans yeah. over here. You know, try. this is also trial and error. And all of a sudden, you're like, you know what? I'm not dealing with the whole corn and beans thing anymore. Then you can do your foundational plantings of your perennial clovers and some of your plots and doing your brassicas, your cereal grains. Um, winter peas is another one you can add into it. Winter rye, wheat, barley, triticale, oats. Yeah. Do all that stuff. It's definitely, Give, I, that's one thing I've seen. It's definitely like a, a trial and error on top of the, obviously the education. Give deer a salad bar. Yeah. That's all I'm going to say. When you go to a salad bar, do you want just salad and that that's yeah. it? No, I want croutons. I want cheese. I want steak put on the top, mushrooms, you know, blah, blah, blah. Give deer a buffet. Because so, if your neighbors are only doing one thing, it's like I, I, get, I would get old with that. It's like, you know, eat cereal every morning. It's like, you know what? No, I want eggs today. I want bacon. I want pancakes, you know. Same concept. Deer get old with it after a while, so. I think you're the one. I think, let's see, we've been doing this probably for over a year now. I think you're the one that, that told me the smorgasbord effect of things, and that's, mm -hmm. you know, we started doing it a lot more, and our plots aren't big, and it keeps them out of the garden. It's like Absolutely. It's thing. They, they rarely ever want to come down to the garden. They'll stay, they don't have no reason. We don't do crazy crazy plots you know i've seen some real big beautiful <laughs> ones you know we make them big or you know you kind of got to have a tractor or a pull behind or something but mm -hmm. um you know we've we started obviously borrowing tractors and then now we have our own but um yeah it's we don't do nothing crazy and we usually do it where i can go up there in a day so like i'll go up there for a weekend we'll get it done my, obviously my uncle has to maintain it and all that stuff but um, a lot of stuff can be done like uh, almost like a work camp. Like I know you said you and your buddy, Scott. So, you know, you and him can get out there one day and get it all done up real fast. You know, um, I mean, my family's blessed. I have a, I mean, my dad has a tractor. We have a Genesis no-till drill and stuff, a three-foot one. It's small, so I can get in in small places and plant. But I still do it the old-fashioned hard way of a weed whacker, a backpack sprayer, broadcasting seed on the ground, places where our tractor and stuff can't get to. And I use a push mower mow some of our clover food plots off. So it's just, man, you know, know the basics too, man, because, you know, once you have the equipment and stuff, it's it's so hard to do it the, the old way. But yeah. you know, st still keep still keep sweating it out, man. Every summer, and, and you know, you'll once you kill a big buck over a plot or the corridor coming by or whatever, you'll be like, all oh, that sweat and tears and blood was so worth it. it. You know, it's almost like equivalent to like if you were to. I mean, it's obviously apples to oranges here, but I always think of the private public land conversation. I'm always like, well, mm -hmm. public land, yeah, you're looking for travel corridors, food sources, water source, whatever, whatever your area is obviously important to get that animal patterned. But then you look at private land, I've always heard the argument of like food plots and like, oh, you know, it's 
you know, he shot him over a food plot. And I'm like, well, he's probably working on that food plot for like three or four years before he even got it to where he wanted to take a oh. buck from it or whatever. And I'm not saying one is bigger than the other or harder or whatever. I've been to public land where I walked out of the truck and shot a buck. And then I've been to others where I get a glimpse of them and I never see them again. And it's a ghost deer. And, you know, so I, I feel like you get the best of both worlds. But that work that goes into, to, goes into that with a, a private spot. And then obviously you get to see the full potential of the animal. That's what I like when you do find. You know, Absolutely. And not you know just what? deer. I don't, honestly, I could care. I like deer. They're okay. And, and I like that and stuff. But the turkeys are, is always what I like mm-hmm. to see. You know, how, how big can they get? And, you know, how, how well does this help them with their spurs and their beard and their poults and. Anything you do habitat management wise for white tailed deer is going to affect other species in a bet in a better way. For sure, one hundred percent. I mean, even our I was telling you about the quail. We started putting those turkey plots in. Now we have quail everywhere. I see them all the time mm-hmm. now. We we're not killing them yet. I haven't seen them that much, but I've seen them enough, and I've never seen a quail. I didn't even know quail were here. See, that's 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 the coolest thing about it. Like I said. I could go off on a tangent here in a rabbit hole real quick about this. Man, I could talk forever about habitat management, but, you know, hey, next topic, we're going to do uh, we're going to do a corn pile conversation, and we're going to do a food plot conversation. Man, that is one of the most heated topics you could ever talk about. Are they baiting, or aren't they? Yeah, that'll be a good one. We'll uh, we'll hype that one up. But what we'll do is we'll uh, I got obviously I got this one recorded, so I'm gonna put this out for uh, you know through people that couldn't make it. I appreciate y'all that did make it. Uh, we'll put this out, um, and we'll be doing this again. So when I put this video out, I'm gonna put it out. Probably it should be uploaded by tomorrow. Um, I'm gonna put on it. Uh, I'm gonna kind of keep it open where whatever y'all wanna have Tyler discuss, well, you can drop it in the comments, and, and you know we can continue this. This food plot series we have going on. Yeah, and uh, like I said, for anybody that listens to what I have to say here, I do appreciate it. And feel free to reach out to me on Facebook if you have Facebook and send me a message. And we can talk about something further that you want to do in your property. Like I said, I do it for a living. I'm a wildlife and forestry private lands consultant. I went to Penn State for wildlife and fishery science. I have a head of knowledge, so tap into it. Nice. Yeah. Well, Tyler, I appreciate it. We'll clip this one off for today and um, I'll get this recording out for the people that, you know, if you didn't get to see it and uh, we'll see you on the next one. All right, man. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. You bet.